Our scripture reading this morning comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 25. Listen to the Word of God. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the... Excuse me. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The Word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, like last week, we are in the letter to the Galatians, and Paul's whole point in the letter to the Galatians is to root out this, this teaching of legalism and ritualism that has infected the Galatian church. Uh, the Galatian Christians had, had some false teachers among them who were teaching them uh, that, that they needed to obey and live by these external uh, Jewish religious regulations which um, Jesus had come to set at least the Gentile people free from. And Paul tells the Galatians that they are free, not free to do whatever they want, but free from the bondage of sin. They are free to be led by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Now, this is appropriate because we are, we are uh, just a few days uh, before the 4th of July when we will celebrate our political freedom as a country. But we know that, that freedom is not simply everyone doing whatever they want because we couldn't possibly live in a country where 300 million of us did whatever we want. That is the image Paul paints when he talks about devouring and destroying one another, because if we were really a country where 300 million people did what they wanted, we would devour and destroy one another. So freedom in the biblical sense must mean something else. Uh, not, neither, neither the Apostle Paul nor any of the authors of Scripture nor God nor even the, the founders of our country saw freedom as simply the ability to follow strictly one's desires, but rather the freedom to pursue something more noble. And that's where we come to today. Paul makes a contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. He lists the works of the flesh, and, and really... We, we can see that going around, all, around us all today. It's, our, it's what I call our sex and substance culture. And many people might be persuaded that freedom is the pursuing of this sex and substance culture that surrounds us, 
that that's what freedom is. Freedom to go out and do those things because that's what I want to do and that's what I feel like doing. But Paul says that's not freedom. In fact, that's the opposite of freedom. That, in fact, is bondage. Bondage to sin, bondage to the flesh. We become slaves to our own desires. See, because the great lie of our culture and the lie that the church must stand up against in the culture is, if I want it, then it's natural. If it's natural, then it's good. But Paul says that there's something wrong deep inside of us. The the flesh doesn't want the right things. It doesn't desire the right things. It desires all these wrong things, these things that will take away our freedom rather than give it to us. So the, the best way to not be free is to do what you want because that gets you into bondage and not freedom. So he contrasts the works of the flesh, the acts of the flesh, with the fruit of the Spirit. Now, you need to understand the difference between what a work is and what a fruit is. Works are what you do. So, so to, to make that contrast clear, you're, you're not going to go out into the garden, you're not going to go out into the orchard, you're not going to go out into the vineyard and, you're, you're, and see you know, an apple tree going, Ugh! right? trying to force itself to, to produce apples, right? The apple tree doesn't have to work to produce apples. The apples come, the fruit comes because of the nature of what is planted. So it's not about work, it's about fruit. While we're on the subject of fruit, understand that, that in English, um, that, that we use fruit as both a singular and a plural word. Uh, you don't use the word fruits, but in Greek you do. And the Greek word here that talks about the fruit of the Spirit is singular, not plural. And so the fruit is singular, not plural. And so the image you should get is, although the artwork is great, Mary Jo did a great job, the, the, the image you should get is not of nine different kinds of fruit. The image you should get is one fruit with these nine characteristics that I'm going to talk about here in a moment. Um, so, so, like we would say an apple is red and it's um, juicy and it's tart, uh, we would say that a banana is yellow and it's soft and it's long, we would say that, that, that a pineapple is kind of prickly on the outside and, and real sour, um, though, though it's a characteristic of that, that one fruit. And so these are nine characteristics of this one fruit of the Spirit that I'm going to talk about here in a second. Um, by the way, you know, speaking of fruit, you know, uh, we also always have to make a distinction in the church between knowledge and wisdom. Well, knowledge is, is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting one in a fruit salad. <laughs> Philosophy is debating whether that makes ketchup a smoothie. <laughs> so we have these nine, these nine characteristics, not these nine fruits of the Spirit, but these nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I love kind of pulling the rug out from under you sometime in terms of definitions and words. That's kind of my thing. I'm going to do it again here in a minute. Um, so let's go through these. By the way, I, I, a couple years ago, I did an in, not in a previous church, I did an entire summer series on the fruit of the Spirit, and each one of these got their own sermon. I'm not going to do it here today, but I'm going to give you kind of the, 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 the quick version of this. So the first one is love. Uh, now, love is a verb, not a noun. Love is an action, not a feeling. Uh, when the Bible says you're to love someone, it's indicating the way you should treat them, not the way you should feel about them. That is the most important thing you need to know about love in the Bible is it is indicating the way you should treat somebody, not the way you should feel about them. So love, joy, joy, not happiness. 
Happiness is about what happens to us. It's right there in the Word. They share, they share the same root. Happiness is about what happens to us. Joy goes much deeper than that. Beyond circumstances, it doesn't come from us. It comes from God. It can abide within us, and we can have joy even when we are not happy. Peace. Now, this is the, the Greek word peace, which indicates harmony. Uh, with God, with oneself, and with, with others. Um, the, Greek, or the Hebrew word shalom kind of goes even beyond that. And to say shalom to someone is to say, I, I wish you everything you need. It, it's an all-encompassing catch-all word. It's, it's kind of like aloha, right? Um, it's wishing someone everything that they need. Forbearance or patience, forbearance in the NIV, patience in some other translations. Um, the, the Greek is fun with this because the, the Greek word is, is, literally trans, is literally translated long burning. So, so it's to have a long fuse, right? We're getting ready for the 4th of July, and you want a long fuse rather than a short one so you don't blow yourself up, right? Um, so how many of you know somebody with a short fuse? It may be you. You know somebody with a short fuse? So the, the Bible is saying that patience, this, that what, what God wants to work in us is lengthening our fuse. Uh, this is another one of my favorite ones, kindness. Kindness. Now, now this is a funny thing because some of us want to stop a bit short in the definition of kindness. If you walked up and down the street and you asked somebody for a synonym of kindness, they'd say nice, right? And that's halfway there, right? We all know about being nice. As a matter of fact, uh, when, when people talk about being Iowa nice, Iowa nice, we hear that all the time, that we're Iowa nice, especially, you know, every, four Jan every 4th January, uh, we get a bunch of people that come into our state that sometimes aren't so very nice, we move them along as quickly as we can, um, but they always comment how nice we are, a and it's wonderful to be nice, but that's not what this word means, at least not totally. Um, it also has the sense of being useful. So if you want a formula, a mathematic equation, uh, you can say kindness equals nice plus useful. And this is, this is one of the things I think that we, we fall into is that sometimes we in church think about all the nice things we can do, and, and, and we could do some nice things for MCSA across the street, and we could do some nice things for Franklin School, and we can do some nice things for, for people in Africa. But here's the question we sometimes fail to answer. Are those nice things useful? Are they of real and lasting benefit particularly in the culture to which we are sending them. Um, you know, if, if, we, if we were to send, um, if, if, if everybody gathered again, this is politically incorrect, but if everybody were to gather together some fur coats and we're going to send these fur coats to people, that would be nice, except if we send them to Africa. And then that's not so nice because they're useless. I, I I sometimes call it, again, a little politically incorrect, I call it reading to the deaf. Some churches are engaged in what I call reading to the deaf. They're doing lots of things, and they look really nice, and the people think that they're doing something, and the people real, really feel good about it, but it's not doing anybody any good. Kindness equals nice plus useful. Goodness, goodness, a synonym for good and goodness is just generosity, just um, beneficence. That's kind of a bit of an older word. Uh, philanthropy would be another good word that would fit under goodness. It's just somebody who has stuff and gives stuff away because they're trying to do good things. Uh, faithfulness. Faithfulness has two meanings. It, it, it has an external and internal meaning. Um, internally, uh, we, we are faithful to God. We have trust in God. We have faith in God. We have reliance on God. And then externally, uh, we ourselves are faithful. We are trustworthy. Uh, we, are, we are capable of being trusted and, and following through with the things that we need to do. 
meekness, or gentleness, I'm sorry, also translated meekness or humility or gentleness. Um, so, this is, this is an agricultural word in the Greek. Uh, it's the word you would use to describe the breaking of a horse, the taming of a horse. Uh, it, it has the connotation of strength under control. Uh, so, tame would be another good way to do it, but we don't like to talk about people being tame, um, but gentle, meek. And finally, self-control, which this really gets at the heart of, I think, the difference between religion and religiosity and legalism and ritualism, the, the kind of things that Paul was fighting against, and what true Christianity is because religion seeks to control people. A lot of people think that God wants to control them. A lot of people think that the church wants to control them. Nothing could be farther from the truth in terms of our ultimate goal. Um, God does not want to control you. God does not want to control me. God wants us to control ourselves. God wants us to learn how to do that. Just like any parent would hope that, that the little people whom they have to ex- over whom they have to exercise so much control from day to day will someday become big people and will be able to control themselves. I'm learning now that that's the whole point of parenting. Did I do a good job? I'll let you know. The jury's still out. This is the kind of inside-out change that is the exact opposite of the legalism that the Galatians were falling into. If If we are followers of Christ, we have crucified the flesh along with its desires, and we now live by the Spirit. We're no longer controlled by desires. We no longer live in that worldly fashion of, if, if I want it, if, if I feel like I want it, then it, that it's natural. And if it's natural, it must be good, so I must go do it. That, that is the opposite of Christian thinking. Understand that none of this lowers the standard. None of this lowers the standard. It changes the motivation. Religiosity has an external motivation. Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, because God's going to be mad at you. The church is going to throw you out. Everybody's not going to like you. That's religion. Christianity, spirituality, says do this, don't do that, because it's, it's good for you. But listen, God doesn't want you to change what you do. God wants you to change what you want. When you find that out, you will discover the secret. I spent years trying to change what I did. And what I needed to do was let God change what I wanted. And when I let God change what I wanted, then what I did changed. God wants to change and transform, not our behavior. He won't settle for that. He wants to change our desires, our inward motivations. God wants to work on us from the inside out, not from the outside in. Now, as we we mature, as we, we come to that point, we need the help of people. We need maybe some external guidance from parents, from church. But understand, that's not the point. The point is inward change. To illustrate this, I can't say anything better than this. We cannot make fruit grow. We cannot make fruit grow. We can't make anything grow, right? Especially me, I've got a brown thumb, right? I couldn't grow a dandelion on purpose. Um, so it's better I live in an apartment. Trust me, it's better for the environment that I just not be involved with any kind of horticulture of any kind. It's just for the best. Um, and, but I don't care if you're a master gardener or an expert farmer. 
you cannot make something grow. You can, you can create the environment. You can prepare the soil. You can carefully select the seed for given conditions. You can plant it. You can water it. You can nurture it. You can cultivate it. But trust me, you can't make it grow. We can't make the fruit of the Spirit grow in us. Only God can do that. What we do have the power to do is keep it from growing. We can do some things that will keep it from growing, but we can't make it grow. But we can cultivate it. We can cultivate it by worship and by study and by prayer and by service. We can, we can cultivate it in ourselves, and we can help cultivate it in others by the Christian community and the practices that we engage in. And so let us cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Let us pray.